Thank you for joining me for the second installation of Sacred Image and the Art of Personal Worship. Today we're going to be focusing on the Renaissance. A lot of us at home are still trying to do our best to connect to Jesus and one of the ways that we're doing that is by personal study. And we can do that through uh, books that we're reading or even going online um, or watching this video. And similar things happened in the Renaissance as well. The Renaissance is between 1300 and 1600 CE. Um, it's defined by an influx of new ideas. And after the Black Plague um, and the devastation that was brought on Europe, a lot of people had to fill in where they might not have before and new ideas and new um, ways of doing things came from all of this trying to figure out what to do next. So the Renaissance is marked by its individuality, by its innovation. There's a connection to nature and to humanity. We have some of the great humanist um, and Christian humanist thinkers starting at this time and talking about how we need to have more of a personal relationship to Christ, that it's not enough to just go through the motions and do all of the liturgy and litanies without knowing and believing and understanding yourself. And if you've read the work of Calvin, you will have seen that he talks about the idea of a dual relationship, the, God, the part of that we can't know God unless we know ourselves as well, and that we can only know ourselves through God. So there is this duality um, within the faith where it's no longer just about the division. It's not just blindly worshiping the divine. You have to also n apply that to yourself. Another innovation of the Renaissance was the printing press. And you start to see more and more books being distributed into, the, into private hands. More Bibles are accessible to the public and it be and there is a desire to read God's word on your own and interpret it and having a personal connection with your faith. Of the books that came out in the Renaissance, we have Dante's Divine Comedy. This was a huge influence in the Renaissance world and especially the world of art. You can see its influence in many different paintings but you can also see its influence in how people responded to the idea of salvation. No longer did you have such a black and white heaven or hell, but you, but through Dante, you had a way of working up to salvation. You had different levels that you could get to. And the church sort of played on this as well. In trying to raise money, the Pope sanctioned the use of indulgences. Indulgences were paid forms of forgiveness. You could pay certain amounts depending on the type of sins and sometimes you would receive a little artifact for that but generally you would make a donation. You could even make a donation um, of artwork to a church and those things would help to buy your way out of purgatory or hell for the various sins that you might have committed. With the ideas from Dante, you could theoretically buy your relatives out of their captivity and purgatory or hell. People did have books of Psalms or Psalsters as they were called, and they were generally hand illuminated or written and those were not nearly as readily available. So when the printing press came along and when you had more types of woodblock prints um, distributed, it was much easier for people at home to get these materials to study and to worship personally. Now that's something that we can do much more easily today. When we think of Renaissance art, we might be thinking of the great Michelangelo's, the Sistine Chapel, 
um, da Vinci's Last Supper or many of the late Renaissance Italian artists. But in this segment, we're going to talk a little bit more about the Northern Renaissance masters, including Dutch, Flemish, and German artists. In this time in artwork, you start to see perspective come into play. The first instances of perspective in art really came to be with Giotto, and we'll talk about him in just a minute. And we then see Michelangelo and other artists later in the Renaissance trying to flesh out bodies to make them more realistic. And they would actually study cadavers to make them more realistic and natural. So we have this idea of, of mortality and realism. There's not so much a holding to the spiritual um, in the same way. And so you have people start to have more of a inner reflection on their own souls, um, the souls of their family, and just themselves in general. And we see this in artwork too. One of the earliest examples is by um, Giotto. He is considered the father of Renaissance art. He's one of the earliest that starts to take on these principles. He's the first person to use any type of real perspective where figures aren't just placed into a scene based on importance, but you actually have um, a more of a natural narrative of, of things. And the paintings of Giotto were for the Scriveni Chapel, also known as the Arena Chapel. The chapel was dedicated by the Scriveni family, and this is a personal chapel um, that was made because the Scrivenis were in the banking business and they were considered usurers, which was which would have condemned their souls. And so the family wanted to make sure that they would have a place in heaven and also that they could buy the souls of their family members out of purgatory. So here we have a painting within the chapel of Enrico Scriveni giving the chapel to the three Marys. Um, it's on the side of the chapel beside the Last Judgment. And within this chapel, there are scenes from Jesus's life all the way up to the final judgment. And the chapel is dedicated to Mary. Giotto was an Italian painter and he worked in the 1300s. He is considered the most important Italian painter of the 14th century and um, really did point to a lot of the innovations that would occur um, throughout the Italian Renaissance. But we're going to stop with for now with the Italian Renaissance because really one of the first things that you learn about in Renaissance art is the northern part of the Renaissance, um, which occurred mostly in with Flemish art and Dutch art. So we're going to take a look at a few of those masters today. Um, we're going to start with a personal altarpiece to get back to the altarpieces and the icons that we were talking about in our last lecture. Um, we're going to look at some personal altarpieces that were used within home worship. This next piece was made for an Italian family by Hugo van der Goes. So it's a Flemish painter um, who painted for the family in Florence. Um, it would have been in a family uh, private chapel um, in a f within Florence, and the painting caused quite a stir for its realism. Rather than having the traditional flat pieces that we saw before, um, this one, the characters are much more fleshed out. We do have some sense of um, scale, however, it is still uh, maintaining the same um, medieval scale uh, based on importance a little bit. Um, the angels are, are different sizes than the regular figures, but also in the side panels you see that there are some smaller people um, and that's based on their importance as well. The side panels show us something that starts to occur a lot more within Renaissance painting and that references um, the votive figure or the person who is sponsoring the painting. They started to creep into the artwork a lot more. Um, this 
was a reflection on where they wanted to see themselves within heaven. Um, again, we have this desire to save our souls more personally. And we start to see people try to do that by buying their way into heaven. And if they're not doing that through buying the church's indulgences, they might be doing that by sponsoring artwork within a church or even personal artwork, because every time that they did this, um, it was sort of like a little blessing upon themselves. And the more they added themselves within the painting, the more that they also added that blessing onto themselves as well. Um, so this painting is interesting because you see not quite the traditional, what we think of, of the nativity. The baby is laying on the ground. Um, this can reference a couple different things. Um, more uh, laying on the stone makes us think of Christ's death. So actually Mary here is more in mourning as well as in worship. And these are not just depictions of the nativity. Um, in many cases, they are taking in pieces of passion plays that were occurring or beginning to occur at that time. And what I mean by passion play is um, there were it, kind of the same way that we have children do plays, the, but the entire town would do them, where everyone would come and participate, and they would, and they would try and bless the town by giving by doing this production of Christ's life. And in many cases, the baby in the middle would not be a real baby, but would actually be baked of a loaf of bread. And then they would all eat the bread at the end and be blessed by his sacrifice. Um, referencing, you know, take, eat all you of it and, and Christ's body is the bread and the Holy Communion. And they thought that if they did this, then perhaps things like the plague would not come back. Um, there's actually a town in Germany, um, Oberammergau, and they still do this every 10 years. The entire town stops everything that it's doing, and they will have the play of Christ's life, and the entire, particip or the entire town participates, and they've been doing this since the Middle Ages, um, which started as a way to ward off plague. So some of these setups where you have everyone surrounding the baby um, come from those plays and our references to that. And so that's sometimes why you might see the baby laying on the ground and you might see him not looking quite as lifelike. We also start to see um, more details in flowers. At this time, um, meaning in flowers really started to circulate a lot more. And um, there were different meanings that were attributed to these. There are some paintings that have hundreds of botanicals um, very delicately and intricately painted, um, each one of them specifying something about um, the Bible or our faith. Um, in this case, we have the oddly placed vase right in front of the child, and it contains scattered violets, which indicate Christ's humility. Columbine flowers represent the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit with which Christ was endowed at his birth. And um, the flowers in the jar are in royal colors. Um, Christ was royal on the line of King David. Um, you also might see things like lilies in other paintings, and that references the Virgin. Um, so we have these, and they have meanings as well. So um, as I was saying in our last portion of the series, there are so many little pieces that were to speak to the everyday people that they would have known that sometimes we don't realize. Um, so it's, it's sometimes fun to look for those little symbols. The next piece that we're going to look at is also um, another altar piece. It's called the Moroda altarpiece. Um, it is an Annunciation triptych, um, so it talks about the Annunciation of Mary. It was done in 1427 through 1432 by Robert Campan, oil on panel. Um, we start to see more contemporary to, to the Renaissance period 
architecture added in and even clothing at times. This again brings us to that humanist side where we're adding in our own um, perspective into the Bible. We're not so much concerned as much with just the otherness of the of the world um, versus our biblical figures. So we start to see them added into our own scenery. Um, this also sometimes references various visions by different saints where Mary might have appeared inside of a church or chapel. Um, but here it also blesses the person who again sponsored the painting. So you might see Mary inside their home and then therefore that is a blessing upon them to have Mary in their home. On the right we have Joseph who is the woodworker in his carpenter's shop. He's drilling holes in a board. Um, we show mouse traps on the bench beside um, there and the window is open to the street. Um, this alludes to some of the writings of St. Augustine identifying the cross as the devil's mousetrap. Um, on the right, or on the left wing, sorry, on the left wing we have the kneeling donor which appears to witness this amazing scene and his wife kneels behind him. A town messenger also stands at the gate. Uh, the owner would have used this triptych in private prayer, but just the idea of having him inserted in this scene would have again given him a blessing on his soul for having sponsored this and this would have been a hope for their own children um, in the future to pray for them and their souls as they moved on. There's a lot of symbolism in here that I'm not going to go into. Um, you could do papers and papers on each of the different symbols within this painting. Um, for instance, um, the saw on the bottom left panel um, is believed to reference the sword that the Apostle Peter would use to slice off the Roman soldier, uh, his ear, on the night that Jesus was arrested. And many of the tools throughout the workspace reference other moments within the Passion um, narrative. However, I do want to look a little bit into the center um, with the Virgin. We see both Mary and the angel. Um, the angel at this point would be speaking to Mary to tell her about the child. On the table again we have lilies um, to reference her purity. Uh, the red is a traditional gown that we talked about in our last session. Um, red denotes humility. Um, also, or I'm sorry, red denotes humanity because humans have blood. Also reminds us of Christ's passion in this case. Here Mary is seated reading the Book of Hours. Um, we will talk about that um, in a little bit and she seemingly is absorbed in her reading so much so that she hasn't even noticed the angel. Um, she's sitting in front of a, of a bench and fireplace. Um, these would suggest the gates of hell symbolically. Um, she blocks the opening and helps humanity avoid hell as well. The table between Mary and the angel has 16 signs referencing the 16 most important prophets of the Old Testament, um, showing Jesus will be the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies um, so that it is fitting to represent that at the Annunciation. There's also a book and a scroll together to reference both the Old and the New Testaments, the old form of writing and the new. Um, on the table is a vase of lilies. Lilies are the most common symbol of the Annunciation. Um, and in works of art, Mary is often uh, signified by the lily and uh, the purity of its whiteness. Um, it also references the Trinity with the th because there are three lilies. The candle on the table with smoke still spiraling up uh, shows that it's re recently snuffed is used to signify God's presence. Um, in the Bible, fire indicates God, that God is present. Um, so there are two notable instances um, when Moses speaks uh, to the burning bush and then there is also the flames of fire on Pentecost. So the candle 
with light often signifies God, but it, this is snuffed out because we're in the moment of the conception of Christ. Um, so there's no symbol for God's presence when God is actually present. So you don't need to have that there anymore when he is actually in the room. And we can see he's coming in the room because in the corner, in the top left, we actually see a little baby Christ with a cross. And this happens in many Annunciation paintings. You'll see either the words of Christ coming down um, and then that is supposed to enter her, or you'll see this little flying baby, which is um, sort of fun. Now the flying baby is riding rays of light from heaven. This references St. Bernard who said, um, just as the brilliance of the sun fills and penetrates a glass window without dam damaging it when emerging, so light pierces its solid form with imperceptible subtlety, neither hurting it when entering nor destroying it when in emerging. Thus the word of God, the splendor of the Father, entered the virgin chamber and then came forth from the closed womb. As I mentioned, the virgin was reading from the Book of Hours. One of the favorite possessions of the Northern European aristocracy in the 14th and 15th century would have been um, books of penitential psalms, devotional prayers, litanies to the saints or the Holy Cross. This particular book that I'm showing here is from the Limburg Book of Hours. A Book of Hours was a book used for reciting prayers. Um, as prayer books, they replaced the traditional psalsters or books of psalms that were the only liturgical books in private hands until about the mid-13th century. Um, many of these would have been hand-painted or illuminated, um, often with um, gold or precious colors. The centerpiece of this book is a calendar. And this brings in a lot of those scientific ideas that are coming in in the Renaissance, or of the ideas um, from astronomy. But it also brings in the humanism. Rather than just having your um, illuminations of saints and figures of Christ and angels and so forth, here we have an the astronom astrological calendar and we have scenes of daily life. And it's a calendar. There are 12 prints. Um, we have, for instance, October, where we are harvesting. Um, there's winter. And every month, it will tell something that happens both within the aristocracy and within the peasantry. But this became a big part of worship at home within this time frame. People had the imagery that they would put on the walls, um, they would have the icons that they would worship, but then they would also have their daily prayers. Um, so that's something to think about as you're doing devotions at home. And here we have another illumination from a book of hours um, of death and vanitas. Here um, death is showing this person an image of himself in the mirror. The mirror, obviously, the symbol of vanity, the um, more ghoulish figure, the symbol of death. And even within these books of hours, these books of prayers, you still had these symbols, these daily reminders of um, don't get stuck in the temporary. Um, remember your immortal soul. In addition to trying to work your way through some spiritual ladder, um, getting your sins forgiven by buying artwork or sponsoring a church or any of number of those things, we see that people within the Renaissance are really thinking about their mortality. And of course they are. Um, we've just experienced before then um, such a loss within the world with the Black Death and there are still so many instances of plague and sickness within the world um, of the Renaissance and so within the home you really start to see um, personal reminders of how to live and we have the you only live once or the 
reference of live your best life. And today we think of that as go and do all these great, wonderful things right now. And don't look back because this is your only life. But they would have interpreted that completely differently. You want to live your best life every day. You only live once and you only have this moment. So live it in the most pure way that you possibly can. There were other symbols that people would put within paintings or just within their homes. And those are memento mores. So you see, other than painting, you see a lot more types of art within the home and for personal use. We have the use of etching and of printing um, more readily available. This particular piece by Albrecht Dürer is St. Jerome in his study. This piece has a lot of detail and almost all of which has a certain symbol of meaning. Um, for instance, we have the lion who might seem a little out of place there, but shows the wildness and the balance of human nature and profound majesty. The dog is for domesticity, light through the window, awakening of the time. Um, the hourglass is that time is running out. The crucifixion is a reminder of our religious task. And the skull on the window um, starts to become a prominent figure in some artworks and the even artworks kept within the home would have these and it is that symbol of inevitable death and in that the life ahead with Christ if we live a pure and holy life it's not meant to be so much doom and gloom it really is more a daily reminder to be our best another print um, this one by Hans Holbein in Germany from 1526. Um, this one is called The Dance of Death, The Miser. And there were actually several of these done um, about death within um, these different settings. Um, this is similar to what I was talking about with the nativity before. There is an interplay between drama and art at this time. This depicts not only a particular artistic movement and style, but also is showing um, the drama that happened in the middle of the 14th century. Um, following all of the epidemics of the Black Plague, um, there were many plays that took place. This particular one that this is referencing would have taken place in a cemetery or churchyard. The actors would have dressed in pale costumes and p painted themselves to resemble skeletons. And um, the purpose of these dances and these plays and these artworks were just to remind us and to remind the populace um, to prepare for their judgment. So here we obviously see the miser who's hoarded his gold and um, when death comes that is useless as well. So Renaissance art sometimes does take on that dark look um, with many memento mori skulls or mirrors reminding us not to be vain or any number of symbolism that tells us that our life is fleeting. I don't want us to think of this as much of a negative. It wasn't a negative for them. I'd like it to be hopeful for us that we remember that though life is fleeting, though there are scary things about us in the world every day, that we do have a hope and that that hope is salvation. And I think it's a great idea to have things around you to remind you of that. And maybe that could be any number of normal objects that we carry. Maybe it's going to be your mask if you wear a face mask as you go out. Say a prayer as you put that on. Not only that you're safe, but that maybe you remember to conduct yourself in a loving way towards others. That you remember not to say things to other people out in that world that might also spread negativity. We often say that we should live life to its fullest. And many times for many people that means that maybe you're doing a lot that day or you're 
living some type of exciting life. But really, what we should remember is to live fully enveloped in God's love and filled with God's spirit. So find something to help you remember God's love in your life, his salvation, and your need to live the best life that you can live. Or find a good book and study a little bit more and get to know your savior and your faith a little bit more deeply. So I hope that you've learned a little bit today about art and worship in the Renaissance. Please join me in our next installation of Sacred Image and Personal Worship when we discuss more about German Romanticism and landscape painting. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to comment or email me in the address below. I will try to I will try to answer any questions or emails either personally or in a video at the end of the series. Thank you.